40 pounds is just started. All right, guys. Uh, so this is, uh, we have two weeks left on, on lecture. So now for this week, we're going to focus on building distributed database systems. So we're taking everything we've learned the entire semester, and now we're going to bring it now into a distributed environment, and I'm basically going to show you how, how much harder it actually is. Uh, so real quick, the homework six is due today at midnight. And then the last project, project four, is due uh, next week on December 6th, which is also the last day of classes. Does anybody have any high-level questions about the last, last programming project? OK. So the other thing is that next week, uh, on Monday, December 4th, we're going to have Barry Morris from NeoDB come give a talk about their system. Uh, I've known Barry for a while now. He's the co-founder former CEO and current executive chairman, although he's there all the time, uh, of NeoDB. So I'm really excited to have Barry uh, come and give a talk, because uh, the way I first met Barry was back in like, must have been 2009, 2010, when I was still a grad student. We had the New England Database Summit or Day at MIT. And this is before NeoDB was called NeoDB. It used to be called NimbusDB. And Jim Starkey, who I mentioned, uh, implemented the first system that, the database system that supported MVCC at DEC. He is the co-founder also of NeoDB. And he came to give a talk, which I completely did not understand. Uh, I, I don't want to say anything on video. Um, but then I was like, all right, this seems like there's something interesting here, but I don't understand what's going on. So we reached out to Barry, had him come down to Brown and gave a talk. And then that's when I, it like clicked for me. And I was like, all right, what they're doing is actually kind of interesting and kind of novel. Uh, it's kind of cool. And that totally made sense for me. So I'm hoping Barry will come and enlighten you guys on, on what NeoDB actually does. And I'll cover, I'll mention a little bit about, as we go along today's lecture, uh, how they fit into the things we're talking about today. And this will be enough to prime you to get ready to understand what Barry will talk about when he comes. And then on the last day of class, Wednesday, December 6th, the lecture will be split into two parts. The first part will be the review for the final exam. Uh, the date is posted, I think it's, the, it's a Friday at like 5.30 p.m., which is a terrible time, but it is what it is. Uh, and I'll be handing out the, a practice copy of that final exam, and that will be the only place you can get it, right? We're not going to post it online. But then for the second half of the lecture, uh, something I traditionally do every year is have what I call the system potpourri. So basically, you guys can go to this URL here, and it'll be, it's a Google form, and you can vote for what database system you want to learn about. And I'll pick the top three or four, and I'll come in and give you a 15-minute crash course on everything you need to know about this database system. What it does, why it's different, why it's interesting, why it may suck. Right? So whatever you guys pick, uh, I, will, I will teach you about it. Um, so I'll say two things. Uh, one, don't pick things like NeoDB or any, any of the time series databases that we already had those guys come give talks, because that's already been covered, and every, everything's on YouTube. And then the second thing I'll say is, I've done, this is like the third or fourth year that I've done this. You can go back in previous lectures and see what the other students that have taken uh, the earlier incarnation of this course have selected. But I ask you that you don't do that. Uh, go, go to this URL first, pick what systems you want to learn about, then go check out what, what other people wanted and see how you match up. Because right? I don't want to say what, what they are because I, I don't want to taint you guys. I want you guys to sort of say, you know, what have I learned on Reddit or Hacker News or on the internet right? and that you want me to come and, and talk about. Okay. So you can vote for multiple systems, but please only vote once, right? It's not a competition. No need to stuff the ballot. OK? Any questions? Yes? What if I just vote for His question is, what if you just vote for one? Yeah, who cares? I mean, like, can I just slowly retrieve the vote? Can you what, sorry? Retrieve the again. Because you say you could have multiple times. Uh, I, don't, I forget what I said with the Google form allows you to vote multiple times, right? Just, like, you could select all of them if you want to do that, right? All right? OK. All right, so, so for this week's lecture, uh, we're now going to focus on distributed systems. So we've already covered parallel systems. We had a lecture on that a few weeks ago. Um, and the, the main thing we were concerned about there was how can we take a query and split it up and have it run in parallel across multiple CPU cores. So, uh, and so in a parallel system, we made this assumption that the the nodes were, would be connected together with a high-speed interconnect, um, and that we're not even going to worry about the, uh, the communication costs of sending data from one socket or one CPU core to another. We also didn't spend time talking about 
uh, fault tolerance or uh, recovery in a parallel system because we just, we just assume that if one node goes down, whether that's a core or a socket or another you know, node in your, in your rack, then we're just gonna say the whole system goes down. But now when we start talking about distributed databases, uh, we can't make the assumption that the network communication is, is minimal or, or, or nothing. Um, and we also can't ignore the fact that if we have a large system that at any time one or, my, or one or more nodes could go down and we don't wanna have to stop the entire system while we wait for that thing to recover, right? We wanna have the system as much as possible to be able to continue and still make forward progress, still process transactions, still ex execute things. So that's sort of what we're, we're focused on today. And as I mentioned at the end of last class, the reason why we're doing this at the end rather than the beginning, because you need to understand all the things we talked about this entire semester uh, for single node databases, and we're gonna apply them now to a distributed environment. So just because you're a distributed database doesn't mean you don't need logging and recovery, right? So all those things still apply in a distributed environment. We still have to worry about concurrency control. We still have to do query optimization and, and planning, right? So basically we're taking all those things that we had from before and now we're putting them in a distributed system. And so this sort of complicates things and some of the problems we'll have to deal with in this environment we didn't have to deal with before, uh, but you'll, hopefully you'll, you'll see how, how all this can, can be put together into a single cohesive database system. And so for this week, it's all distributed databases. Uh, the, but what I decided to do was split up the lectures to focus on online transaction processing databases today. And then on Wednesday's lecture, the next lecture, we'll focus on uh, analytical systems. And the reason why I'm making this distinction is that the types of problems you have to deal with when you implement a, da a distributed database uh, for an OLGP environment or a OLAP environment uh, will vary a lot. There'll be some high level things that we'll cover in the beginning that'll be the same across both systems, like replication, for example, or you know, how do you crash and bring up, bring up a node. Um, but the things that a OLTP system has to worry about uh, and try to optimize for are different than an OLAP system. And this is because the workloads are different. So in an OLTP system, we're gonna be mostly doing transactions that are gonna be modifying the state of the database. Uh, and those transactions are only gonna make small changes Right? Think of like you log into Amazon, you update your payment information. That's a transaction. You're only updating just the records that pertain to you, not updating the entire table. Um, so therefore, they're also short-lived, and they're also repetitive, meaning you're doing the same operations over and over again. In an analytical system, uh, you're not really doing updates. Although you would take batch updates or maybe some streaming updates from the front-end O2P system, the, the transactions are not actually making changes to the state of the database. And so instead, we have long-running queries that are gonna read large portions of the database and to compute, compute some kind of complex aggregation or join operation. We also tend to see also what are called exploratory queries or ad hoc queries, meaning it's not a program running the same transactions to the same queries over and over again. It's someone opening up a terminal or someone opening up a, a visualization tool like Tableau or MicroStrategy and running queries that we've may, we, we, we never seen before and we may never seen again. So I always like to show this uh, sort of Venn diagram that uh, Mike Stonebreaker came up with a few years ago that sort of shows you on two axes how the workloads are, are different. So along the y-axis, you have operation complexity. So at the lower case, you have simple queries, right? Updating a single record, uh, retrieving a single record, single keys, lookups, things like that. And then at the top, you have more complex things, right? These are multi-way joins. Uh, trying to retrieve a, a lot of information on, on full table scans. And then along the x-axis, you have whether the workload is focusing on doing a lot of writes or doing a lot of reads. So again, for OLTP, it's a lot of writes that are mostly simple. And then the upper corner, you have OLAP queries where they're, they're very complex, but they're doing mostly reads. Now, the HTAP stuff is sort of, a, is sort of the, uh, encompasses both of them. And that's where, sort of why it's in the middle. And the, in the, the diagram that Mike originally made for this article, in the middle, he had social networks, right? Because they're doing uh, a lot of writes that are simple, but a lot of complex query analysis to figure out who your friends are and things like that. Um, I've since replaced that with HTAP, the hybrid workload. And so that's sort of, again, that's, that middle part is, is trying to do best, trying to do both things inside a single database system. We're not gonna cover that here. We'll cover that in the, in the next semester to show how to do this uh, all in single database systems, but in the context of a single machine. We won't do distributed HTAP systems. Um, but in general, again, so for today's lecture, we're focused on the bottom, OLTP, and the next class, we'll focus on OLAP for distributed environment. 
So we'll start off talking about the different kind of distributed system architectures you can have for distributed databases. Um, then we'll cover some design issues we're going to have to deal with and overcome in order to allow the system to actually operate correctly with minimal impact to the application. And then we'll talk about how to do distributed concurrency control, replication, and then depending on how much time we have left, I'll focus on or discuss the CAT theorem in terms of how it applies to uh, distributed databases. There's a quick show of hands. Who here has taken a distributed systems course or t is taking it now? All right, so I say, if I say Paxos, that's really familiar with most of you guys, right? Good, okay, awesome. All right, so, so the, there's essentially four types of system architectures you can have. And so what we've covered so far in this semester is what is called shared everything. So think of, again, a single node that has a processor or one of the that have uh, access to uh, some, some, some pool memory and have access to some disk, right? We can scale these out horizontally within a single box, but everything's contained in, in a single logical space, right? So shared everything means everything, every processor can read every disk and every processor can read, read to any, any chunk of memory. And so the distributed architectures are the other three here. So shared memory, shared disk, and shared nothing. So I'm gonna go through each of these one by one and understand uh, their trade-offs and understand what they actually mean. So in a shared memory system, what you have is that you're gonna have one or more processors or CPUs that will have access to a uh, global address space of memory. And this, this memory is not always gonna be local to it. So think of a single box, it has a CPU, it has memory, but then there'll be another, another box in the same cluster that has its own CPU and memory, but any, other, any node or any box can access memory to any other node. Right? So think, again, think of a distributed shared memory. It's a global address space. And so this means that any processor can look inside of memory of another machine and see what's going on inside of it. Right? And so this means that you can have a, all the same sort of single data structures that we talked about before, like a single hash table, a single buffer pool manager, and things like that, that all the different processors can write to and read from uh, and the, there's a fast interconnect that allows you to, to sort of shuffle those requests over to the machine that has that particular chunk of memory you're trying to access um, without knowing anything actually where it is. So you write to an address space in memory, and if it's on a local machine, it's fast. If it's on another machine somewhere else, there's some transport or some hardware device that takes care of that for you. So uh, I'm sure someone's gonna correct me on YouTube, but to the best of my knowledge, the only system that, actually, that I can find that actually does this type of architecture is the a product that Oracle sells called Oracle Rack. And again, they use a distributed memory fabric to allow you to read and write into the buffer pools of other, other nodes. So this is not just sort of taking, you know, taking Postgres and making it use a shared memory pool or in-memory fabric. You do actually have to modify the database system to be understand that it's running on one machine and there's, a, there's other machines that are also writing to the same address space, right? Because you think of like in Postgres, for example, when you boot it up, there's this thing called the Postmaster that thinks it's the central point for that, for that database. And if you now have Postgres running on different machines with a distributed memory fabric, now you have multiple Postmasters that each think it's in charge, but now there's other processes that it doesn't know about writing into memory. Right, so you do have to, it's not just taking any off-the-shelf database system and running it on this environment. You do have to modify the system to be aware of that there's other instances of the database. But the low-level coordination you have between those processes is all done through this over the network into shared memory. The, the next type of architecture is called shared disk. Um, the way to think about this is that you're gonna have a, a single node will have its own processor and its own memory but the disk will be shared across multiple machines. So again, if you're familiar with, with sort of cloud computing or Amazon's environment, think of this as like EBS is the shared disk that you, you can write all your changes to. So the, this is actually becoming more common in the last 10 or 15 years, right? These ideas are not new, they've been around for a long time, but this has become, shared disk has become more prevalent in recent years because now in these cloud environments, you have this persistent storage like EBS, and then you can have your different EC2 instances uh, that can all access to it. So the key advantage of shared disk is that it allows you to scale up the execution layer or the, the execution nodes separately from the disk. So depending on whether you're disk bound or CPU bound, 
you can increase capacity by adding new nodes that target one specific layer, right? I'll show an example of what I mean in the next slide. And so the, you could treat the, uh, the shared disk as the central location where you have state or you exchange state between the different processors, um, but that would be slow because you have to send things over the network to, 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 to the storage, and then you have to hope somehow the other processors can find that, that update. Um, if you want to get better, better performance, you can have the different execution nodes or the, the processors send messages in between the CPUs so that they can learn about the state of each other. Um, but this is something you have to add in your database system. I, you, you, the, the shared disk model doesn't do this for you automatically. So let's look at an example. All right, so say we have a single application server, and then we have two nodes in our execution layer. And again, at the, these execution nodes, yeah, there's, they obviously have a disk. Right, because you can't boot an operating system in this environment you know, with, without a disk or something. Uh, and then, but the, but the, uh, the way to sort of think about it is the, there's no state of the database stored permanently in these execution nodes. So the primary storage location of the database at all times has to be in, this, in, the, in, the, in the storage layer. And I'm showing this as sort of as an amorphous uh, disks. Um, right, so again, think of this as e EBS, where you just sort of say, I want these volumes, and you don't really care how many machines Amazon actually uses to, to store that. Um, it just does, manages all that for you. Or say you have a NAS or a SAN or, or a file server uh, that you're running on-premise, right? That would be sort of hand handled in the storage layer. And the, 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 the execution layer, those nodes don't really need, need to know how many machines you're actually using to, to serve out the shared disk. All right, so let's say your application server now sends a query request. It goes to this node. And now all the same things that we talked about before for our buffer pool manager apply here. So the machine's going to check to say, oh, I need to access this tuple. Uh, it's in this page. Do I have this page in my local memory? If no, then I got to go out to the shared disk and go copy it, and I'll swap it into, in, in, into memory here. And then it gets sort of complicated if you're doing updates. How do you pin things if it's, if it's over there? Right, but for that, we, we can ignore for now. All right, so now, same thing. If I need to go to this, this node here, I can, I can access the same page, and it's going to get that copy from the, the storage layer and bring it into its buffer pool, and then it can process the query. So all the same things that we did before are applied here. It's just now the, the disk is on another machine rather than, than local to, to me. So let's say now I find out that I'm CPU bound or I'm memory bound, and I need to increase my execution layer capacity. So with this, I can just bring in a new node and have it work just like all the other nodes, right? And not have to worry about copying any data because all the state of the database is in the, is in the shared disk storage layer. So you can sort of think of these as the execution nodes are stateless, and I can bring them up and down as needed without worrying about having to move data around because the shared disk is always going to have the complete copy of, of the database. So now one, one optimization you can do uh, it, or is it, sorry, if, if say you need to create your, increase your capacity on the storage layer, uh, you can just add more disks uh, on that. And again, that doesn't affect the, the, ex, the execution layer. All of a sudden, the disk is faster, or you have more disk. right? And you, don't, you didn't have to change anything or move any data around at the execution layer to make that happen. Now, of course, Amazon and EBS could be moving your data around, and you don't know it. And from the database's perspective, you don't care. Right? That's sort of handled all underneath the covers. So now one optimization you can do, let's say you want to do an update here. Uh, if, you have the, if, if all state about the database is only stored in the storage layer, and therefore if you do this update, you have to make sure that, uh, that either you have the only copy of the thing you're trying to update, or you have a way to have these guys pull from the storage layer and get the new version. Um, but one, one obvious optimization you can do here is sort of do a sideways message passing. And have the system somehow know at the execution layer that for this particular tuple, I know that my other nodes have a copy of it. So therefore, I'll sort of broadcast that update to those guys and have them get, a, get an updated version without having to go out to the, to the, the shared disk to get the latest version. Right? And you can do this because the, we have the connection between the execution layers is usually always faster than the connection to the, the storage layer. And the storage layer, again, is going to have some, some block size that or some large block size for, for a, a transferring data, whereas if you're sending direct messages over TCP between these different nodes, 
then you can do more fine grain updates. So this is sort of a, is an obvious optimization, op optimization. Not all shared disk systems actually do this, but this is actually what one thing that NeoDB do, does do. Yes? Yeah, but then if your node is fetching some uh, piece of data from the storage, doesn't it also have to tell all the other nodes that I have this copy? And can there be a delay between that and the broadcast such that I just fetched a copy, but missed the, the, the broadcast? Okay. So, so your question is, uh, if, if, you're, if the only copy of the data is here, and so when you do your update, you're at the top, and then someone tries to update the same piece of data at the bottom? Uh, no, it's just uh, if I store all the copies of the same, uh, of the same data on the nodes, then when I fetch a new piece of data, yes. I, have to, uh, I have to broadcast to my peers that I now have this piece of data. All right. So his, his statement is, if I fetch a new the bottom guy fetches a new piece of data, you need some kind of directory service to tell the other guys, hey, if you need this piece of data, I actually have a cached copy of it, right? And yes, so, so you do have to maintain, which I'm not showing here, some additional coordinator or leader that, that keeps track of what node has what piece of data so that when you have to propagate updates, instead of broadcasting it everywhere, because now that, that would be you know, a, an end way message send out for every single update, you only send it to the nodes that you, that you know have a copy of that data. Yes, you do have to do that. I'm not showing that here. And that, that is actually something that NeoDB does. Yes? Say it again? Uh, so, it, so you said the word buffer pool and then the broadcasting. So the buffer pool is just the same buffer pool we talked about last, or, you know, in the early in the semester. I need a page. It's not memory. Let me go fetch it, and then you either fetch it from another node or you fetch it from the shared disk. In a shared disk environment, typically you always want to get it from from the shared disk because that's the that's that's the primary copy. So now, you, so now you want to say, let's say I do an update here. The say the top node is the has the, it's the leader for a particular item, a data record. But it knows that there's copies of the other two nodes. So if a transaction doesn't update at the top node, it says, oh, well, when I commit, I should send my, the latest version to the, to the, uh, yeah, the end memory of the other ones. Right? You don't have to do this. Right? It's just an optimization to avoid having everyone to do a round trip to, to go get the latest version from shared disk. Right? Say it again. Is there, is there, these nodes here? This is, think of this as a black box. You don't know how many disks there are. You don't know what's on the disk. You just know that there's some, like a key value store. Give me, this, give me a page with this page ID, right? We should be covering the language. You bring a new execution node, right? I, so I'm ignoring the fact, uh, so we'll get to this later, but I'm not mentioning anything but how this application server figured out I need to go to this node to get that data. For our purposes, it doesn't, in the most simplistic form, it doesn't, you don't need to do this, right? Like what you could do is the most naive shared disk architecture is basically every node doesn't know anything. And every time you want to access a tuple, you always go to the shared disk to go get that version, the, the tuple. And then when you go commit, you try to write it back and you see whether somebody else has already modified it. That's the dumbest thing you can do because it'd be super slow. Yeah, well, what do you mean by the green? So, when you, so say, I want to, say I'm back here. I have two nodes, right? And now I'm CPU bound. I want to scale out. When people talk about elastic databases, they mean adding more capacity. And either can be for, for, for computation or memory or for storage. So if I'm going to increase my computation and memory, I can bring a new node in, but because there's no, the, there's no database state in, these, the, in the execution nodes, I can bring it up without having to reshuffle anything. Because the shared disk always has the complete copy of the database, and my, node now's, my new node is going to know how to go talk to it and start copying things in that it needs to process queries. Correct. This is a shared disk environment. Again, there's a disk here because you have to have, in order to boot the system up, Right, and log stuff, right? Like, but the, this, the storage location of the database is on these disks over here. 
right? And another advantage that you see this also in cloud environments is, say that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it's at the end of the day and I don't need to process any more queries. I can shut down these execution nodes and just keep the, the shared disk there. Right? You pay, you know, you pay Amazon for the maintenance of, of the, the, the retaining the storage, but you're not paying for updates and other things that aren't happening. Whereas if, as we'll see this in the next slide for shared memory, if the, the state of the database is stored here, I have to keep everything there and keep these machines live. Otherwise, if I shut them down, I lose everything. Right, so there's this nice decoupling between these two layers. And as I said, um, from, the, from these list of systems here, uh, all of the big sort of cloud service providers that have offer uh, database systems are always going to be th this environment. So Spanner, Amazon, Aurora, Redshift, uh, they're all going to be based on shared disk architecture. Things like HBase, Stinger, and Presto, Impala, these are systems designed to run on HDFS, and you can give HDFS as the, the shared disk. Um, Snowflake is, is a new DB. Snowflake is for, for OLAP queries. Think of that as like Redshift, same thing. You can have separate execution layer and, and, and storage layer. And then new DB, as, as I said, uh, has a sort of storage manager that's the shared disk, and then you have a bunch of execution uh, nodes that can pull data in and process transactions. Okay? Yes? Does a typical distributed file system have to be a storage layer, or does it have to have some extra properties? So his, this is, that's a great question. So his question is, is the, your favorite off-the-shelf distributed file system, HDFS, probably what people think of mostly, is that good enough here for, to be a shared disk, or do we need something special? So if you look at systems like HBase, for example, HBase is, runs on top of HDFS, right? The basic thing you need to make this work is just get and put, right? I need to get a block, I need to put a block. And that's, that's all you really need. Now, with HDFS, because it's append only, you have to use a log structured architecture, which we talked about before, so that you're just always appending to a file because you can't go back and do in-place updates, right? Uh, Systems like Aurora is a good example where Amazon actually added some additional stuff in the layer, I think above EBS, that allows them to do things more efficiently than just always appending to HDFS. So your question is, is, a, is your off-the-shelf distributed file system enough to make this work? The answer is yes. For analytics, who cares about doing in-place updates because you're just reading files as fast as possible. So all you really need is get. That's, that's enough. For transaction processing, you, you either need to use a log structured architecture like an HBase or add additional mechanisms like in the case of Aurora. Right? In the case of NuoDB, they basically implement their own key value store um, and that's enough to be a shared disk. It's a good question. Okay. So the next architecture that people usually think of when you think of a distributed database, it's called shared nothing. Uh, so again, this is the term that's been around for a while. If you, if you Google shared nothing, Stonebreaker, of course, wrote a paper in the 1980s that touts the virtues of shared nothing. But again, most people, when they think, I'm going to build a distributed database, they really mean the, the shared nothing architecture. And here, basically, the idea is that every node is going to have its own CPU, its own memory, its own disk. And the, it can't view into the memory of other machines. It can't write to a shared disk. Right, the only way that it can communicate with other nodes in the cluster is to go over, uh, do message passing over TCP, right? And so the advantage of this is that it's, it's, it's somewhat easy to increase capacity because you just sort of plop up new nodes, but the tricky thing is going to be how do you maintain consistency, right? How do you add new nodes and rebalance uh, while you're executing transactions? So let's look at an example here. So here now I have two nodes. And again, on each node, now we have the processor and memory and disk. And then now I'm showing you uh, sort of a, a, a rudimentary partitioning scheme where at partition P1 at the top, I'm going to have all the, the records for a table where they have the ID values from 1 to 150. And at the bottom, I have all the IDs from 150 to 151 to 300. So now if, if I have a query comes along and it wants to get ID get the record ID equals 200, ignore the fact, ignore the, the, the question of how the applications were figured out how, that it needed to go there. We'll cover that later, but just assume that it knew, it knew how to get there, and that's the node that has the data that it wants. So it can go to that one node, that one node can process that, that query entirely and send back the result to it. 
So now let's say I have a query that wants to get uh, ID equals 10 and the record where ID equals 200. Um, it would send the request to that single node, and that, that node would know about how to find where ID, the value, find the record where ID equals 200, and then it can send just the part of that query down to the, uh, to, to the node here, get back the result, coalesce it, then send it back to the, the single node. So this has come up when we talk about data, trans data transparency here, but the idea is in our distributed database, the application doesn't need to know anything about how the data is stored. It just knows that it can go to some node, whether it's one or any of them, and that node has enough information to figure out how to route your query or part of your query to the nodes that have the data that you need and send it back. So now the tricky thing is, how do we increase capacity? So in the shared disk environment, I said that the, the execution nodes are stateless, so you just bring up a new one, and then you, know, you obviously update some catalog information to say, here's the partitioning information, uh, but you don't have to move any data around. And then in terms of increasing capacity on the shared disk uh, layer, that's sort of handled by EBS or, or whatever you know, file system you're using to make that work, and we don't care about that. But in our environment, we have now, we control everything in a shared nothing system. So if I want to add a new node, that means I'm bringing in uh, its own processor memory and, and data, and I need to figure out how to move data, uh, rebalance the system. So what I want to do is I want to take some portion of the data from the top node and move it to the, to the middle, and some portion of the data from the bottom and move it to the middle. So then my partitioning scheme looks like this. So now every partition, every node has you know, e an equal size of, of, the, of, uh, of data. So this seems trivial, and obviously moving data around is not that hard. It's just copying bytes. The tricky thing, though, is if we're doing this in for an OLTP application, we want to be able to continue to execute transactions while we're moving this data around and not have any false negatives and not have any false positives. So we don't want to send a query, say, for ID equals 150, uh, and we, before we would send it to the top, but then as we're doing our transition to move data to, to the middle, the, the query lands at the top, it does the lookup, and that data's already been moved, and, and then it comes, back with a, you know, uh, it comes back with an empty result, even though the data actually exists, because that, that would be a false, false negative. So we want to make sure that when we move data around, that we don't, we hide all this, right? So the easiest way to do that is actually just stop everything while you move data around, but if you're moving you know, terabytes of data, that could take a long time, and you, and you don't want to do this. So I'm not going to talk about this here, but I've done research in the past with other, other colleagues about how to ensure that you can continue execute transactions while you still move data around. And sort of the, the, the way to think about it is that you're just doing some extra bookkeeping and you're doing deletes and inserts to, to, to take data out of one machine and put it to another machine, all in the context of a transaction. But again, the main takeaway I want to get from this between shared disk and shared nothing, with shared disk, we need to let the disk whatever that disk layer we're using, let that handle scalability, and we just worry about our execution nodes. In a shared nothing architecture, we have to worry about everything. So I would say that, again, most distributed databases built in the last 15 years follow this architecture, but there's been a different trend or different movement towards the shared disk model, uh, especially for OLAP queries, uh, because cloud computing has become so prevalent, because EBS is, is, is good enough. So, uh, lest you think distributed databases are new, uh, they've been around a long time. Uh, and the usual suspects for, for building databases are, have built distributed databases. So, Mike Stonebreaker uh, and Phil Bernstein built the first, so what we know as the first distributed databases. Um, Stonebreaker, again, was, the, was sort of working on Ingress at the time. So, they have a tech report from 1979 that talks about the distributed version of Ingress called Muffin. Uh, I asked him one point what Muffin actually stands for. Uh, I'm not sure whether he was joking or not, but he said it stood for <laughs> uh, And then uh, SCD1 stands for the System for Distributed Databases. Um, so Phil was the early transaction processing professor at Harvard, and then he built this in, co in, in conjunction with CCA. There's a great talk uh, that, that he gave this summer, and I, ha I have to put it on YouTube, I have it, where he talked about the early days of SCD1 and all the problems they had to deal with. Um, but these two are considered to be the first uh, distributed databases. Uh, and then uh, Mohan from Aries from last class of Aries fame, he was at IBM Research and he helped build system R-Star, which is the distributed version of R. Um, David DeWitt built this academic system called Gamma. Technically, it's a parallel database machine, not a, not a full distributed database or shared nothing database system. 
Um, but a lot of the ideas that came out of GAM are, are certainly used today in distributed systems. And then Jim Gray of the early system R days at IBM, he worked on a fault tolerant distributed database called uh, Nonstop SQL at Tandem. Uh, what, the way they achieved fault tolerance is through super hardware redundancy. So like on a single machine, it would have three redundant processors or three redundant sticks of RAM, and it would always run those things uh, at the same time. All right, so again, this just shows you distributed databases are not a new idea. Uh, and people, are, you know, people struggled with them that, back then, and people struggle with them now, right? They're very difficult. All right, so now that we have an idea of what our system architecture is going to look like, for the rest of the lecture, I'm mostly going to be focusing on shared disk and uh, shared nothing. And I'll try to sort of specify when something we're talking about is specific to shared nothing and not shared disk. But for the most part, a lot of the ideas are, are you, have to, you have to apply both, a lot of these ideas for both different models. For shared memory, again, that's a, um, I think they'll become more prevalent in the future, uh, certainly with like uh, RDMA and, and other things. But for now, again, it's, it's, there's not many systems that follow that model. All right, so the questions we have to deal with now are, how are we going to store data across the nodes? How's the application going to find the data? If I have a query and I send it to a node, wh what node do I send it to? Or how, how, how's that node going to know where to go find that data that it wants? Um, how are we going to actually execute our queries on our distributed database? So this will be mostly going to be an issue we'll cover next class. But the basic two models are you either push the query to the data, and then send back the result, or you pull the data you need, bring it to the machine that you're at, and then process the query there. So the shared disk model would be an example of the, the second approach, right? Because you can't execute any queries on the shared disk. It just, it's always get or set, or get or put. So you're going to get the blocks you need that you think has the data you want, process the query, and then send back the result. Again, we'll cover this more and when we talk about OLAP queries, because in, in OLTP, it's, it's fairly simple, right? Because you're going to go get a single record uh, the, 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 the act of getting that single record is more or less the same as, as copying the, the block back and then get processing the query on it is basically the same as sending the query over. And then, of course, the hard problem is how is the data system going to guarantee correctness during all of this when we're, when we're doing updates? So I mentioned this before, but the key thing about a distributed database that we want to have is that the, how the data is, is stored physically across multiple machines should be completely transparent to the application. So that I mean nowhere in your application code should you say, all right, I need, I need to touch ID, you know, record ID equals four, well, I want to go to node four for that, or I want to go to node five, right? We want, some, we want an abstraction layer that hides all the details of this from the application code. So that way, if we have machines go down, uh, if we scale up or scale out, we don't have to go back and update the application. Because the state of where to find the data we need is essentially a database in itself, right? It's like the catalog, it's the metadata about the data. So all the guarantees we want for our regular database, we want to have for that partitioning information, for that catalog information as well. And so we don't want to have that be put inside the application because now if there's, if, you know, if there's a failure, we have to make sure all the applications know that this node is no longer available and this is, the, this is the other node you should actually go to to get that data you want. Another way to think about this is that if you have a SQL query, and, it, and you have a copy of your database that can run on a single node, then when you go to a distributed environment, that same exact SQL query should run without any changes. And this is the beauty of a declarative language like SQL, where you don't have to worry about you know, how you actually, actually implement things. You just, here's my SQL query, you shove it off to some machine, and then it figures out where the data is that you need and how it should process the query. So we've already talked about partitioning before when we talked about timestamp ordering. I want to mention a little bit here, and then we'll cover it more in the, the, the next lecture. But I was, I was mentioning how it pertains, or what kind of partitioning we're going to care about in a distributed OTP system. So again, partitioning is, is basically taking the database, and we're going to split it up across multiple resources. Right? So we have some giant, ta some giant table, and we want a way to say, all right, some portion of the data goes on this node, some portion of the data goes on that node, and then we, up we have some uh, internal metadata catalog that knows how to find the data you need based on what the query is actually looking for. So the traditional or the academic way of describing this, what these chunks of data are called, are partitions. In the NoSQL systems, or usually out in, in the, I suppose, real world, they're also often called shards. So partitioning and sharding are essentially the same thing. They're just different words for the same concept. 
So again, what's going to happen is we're going to partition or shard the database, and then when the query shows up, the database has, can know, all right, I need to touch this data, or here's the nodes I need to go, go look at or talk to to find the data that I need, and then you maybe send some portion of the query as fragments to those nodes. They execute the query, their, their portion of the query, you return data, and then combine that all together to produce a single answer. Right, so from a single terminal, if you type a select statement, that may be blasted out to a thousand machines and then put all together into a single response and send back to you as, 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 a, as a single message. Right, you're not going to get a thousand responses back for every single, every single node in your cluster. But again, from the application standpoint, you don't know and you should not need to know how many machines are actually involved in your query. So the main type of partitioning we're going to talk about for OTP applications is horizontal partitioning. Again, we've already covered this from timestamp ordering, but the basic idea is that we're going to pick some set of attributes or columns that we're going to use to divide the, 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 a table up uh, and where each, each tuple will get its entire contents will be put inside of a single partition. Right? So if you remember from DSM or NSM, right, the column store for the row store, think as horizontal partitioning is doing sort of uh, row partitioning. You take an entire row and you're storing it in, in, on a single partition. And so we'll cover this in the next class, but the ways you do partitioning could be either round robin, just sort of picking random uh, in order what partition to assign two plus two. Hash partitioning is taking the, the values of, of the partitioning key and hashing it, and then mod n by the number of machines you have, sending it to a node. And then range partitioning we already showed before, where you basically say keys within range from one to a thousand go here, one thousand to one to two thousand go there. So I showed this diagram before from TPCC. This is just to show you why we can do partitioning in OTP, and uh, it's going to solve some of these problems we're going to deal with when we talk about distributed concurrency control. So if you take the warehouse and district table from, from the, the schema, when you look at the actual create table statements, you'll see that in the district table, it has a foreign key reference to the warehouse ID in the warehouse table. So what we're going to want to do is we want to uh, devise a partitioning scheme such that all tuples of the same warehouse, because the warehouse is always going to be the parent, will get put into a single partition so that most of our transactions only touch data at one partition. All right, and then we, we can scale those things out independently without worrying about doing any coordination between them. So essentially we're taking the schema, we're going to put it into a tree structure like this, again where sort of a, a slice down is within a tree is always going to be data within a, within a single warehouse. In the case of the item table, it doesn't have a warehouse ID, so we're just going to replicate that on every single node, or every single partition. So now when we assign data to partitions, again, we'll take the warehouse ID, and we either hash partitioning, or range partitioning, or round robin, it doesn't matter, and then we'll assign them to, to these partitions one by one. In the case of the item table, again, because it doesn't have a warehouse ID, we're going to replicate that on every single node. Of course, that, that means that anybody that comes and updates the item table, we have to make sure we broadcast that to every single partition so that everyone has a consistent view of, of the same table. So we typically do this for tables that are small and tables that are, that are read mostly. Yes? Question two slides back. Okay. Say when. Uh, yeah, right here. So you say that you choose columns that divide the database equally? Like each tuple contains all of its columns? Yeah, so, 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 so think of like you pick a column. I have, I have five columns. I pick the second one. And then for every single tuple, I'm going to look at that second column, hash it, hash whatever value that tuple has, and then, then you assign it to a partition. Okay, right? And uh, they actually bring up a good point here is in my example, I'm just, I'm just doing sort of a hashing. Just every, every partition is going to have an equal amount of data. In practice, you may actually not want to do that because the tuples may not always be the same size and they may not always be accessed with the same frequency. So this is very common you see in uh, social networks where the very popular people are essentially given uh, a rack of machines to themselves and the, only the data for that particular celebrity is stored on that, on that rack. So Justin Bieber is the famous example of this. Justin Bieber has his own rack of machines at Twitter. I'm sure Donald Trump does too. Uh, and so the part, so it's sort of, Justin Bieber is his, is his own partition of data uh, because they're CPU bound because everyone's trying to access his, his updates and tweets, right? And so how you partition things can depend on what objective function you're trying to maximize or try, what, what resource you're trying, trying to maximize. Okay, 
So again, we assign these things to partitions, and then we, we, we replicate the item table everywhere. So now, if we have an application server comes along and wants to do, uh, a, do a, a access this data at this one partition, right? Uh, it can start a transaction. Then it says, all right, here's the query I want. I want to execute, give me, give me the record from the warehouse table from where warehouse ID equals one. And then I can go ahead and commit. So this is the best case scenario for a distributed database system. Because at no point did I need to touch data at any other partition. So in order for me to commit this transaction that only touched data partition one, I only need to look at what happened at my single partition. I don't need to check with anybody else. So this is the ideal scenario in a distributed transaction processing database. And for a lot of applications, it is the case that if you, if you, can, you can transpose the schema into a, that tree structure so that you can do this. So these are referred to as either single node or single partition transactions. Right? These, are, these are what you want, to have the, the, you want to maximize in your database system. So you want to choose a partitioning scheme that, that allows you to get most of these. Because again, you don't need to coordinate with any other node or any other partition running with any concurrent transactions running there because you know they couldn't have read any data that you read because they, you didn't read anything at their partition. This, not all applications actually can work this way though, right? Uh, the, and in that case, you have what's called a distributed transaction. And this is where you have a transaction that's either accessing, reading or writing data at, at two or more partitions. Right? So now what's going to happen is now you are going to have to coordinate between different partitions. And now you're going over the network. And now you're sending messages. And now you have to figure things out of what's, what's going on. Right? And I'll say that um, a lot of times you, don't, you can't partition the database uh, into, so that everything's, be, everything's single partition. Because, um, because of just so the schema doesn't fit that way, or the access patterns of queries don't work that way. But also times there's, there's also like legal reasons why you can't do that. So in 2009 or so, we went to go visit a uh, very well-known payment processing um, uh, company in, in the Valley, because uh, they wanted to come talk with Stonebreaker and see whether we could solve their problems. And they had this restriction where, uh, bank accounts from people from different countries couldn't be on the same partitions or the same hardware. So if you were sending money from somebody in the same country, that was always, could, could possibly be a single node transaction or single partition transaction. But if you had to send money from me to, to somebody in, in China, that those two accounts would be on separate machines, so that would always be a distributed transaction, which is always much, much more expensive. Right, so again, the, you want to maximize the single partition transactions, but it's not always the case you'll be able to do that. All right, so now, if we're going to have distributed transactions, now we've got to figure out a way to, to, how to coordinate their execution. And so the first thing we have to talk about is how we're actually going to design our distributed database system to be aware of what transactions are going on and then allow us to make decisions about whether transactions are allowed to commit or not. So the sort of thing of this is the same concurrent scroll stuff that we talked about before, but in a shared everything system, we have a global view of the database because everything's on, on, on our single node. But now in a distributed environment, you could have transactions touching data at different nodes, and we need something to figure out whether they're allowed to do that and whether they're allowed to commit and make changes. So there's essentially two approaches to this is a centralized approach. We have a global traffic cop that has, again, a complete view of everything that's going on. Well, I, almost a complete view. I'll say why in a second. And then you have a decentralized architecture where the nodes essentially have to figure out amongst themselves whether transactions are allowed to commit. So the, yes? His question is, are there any transactions that can be distributed? Yeah, I, I, just, I just mentioned that before, right? Yeah, so does it mean, like, we can't use shared nothing His question is, does this mean we cannot use shared nothing in the scenario? Why wouldn't you be able to use shared nothing in the scenario? Because you can be distributed. Wait, 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 why can't you be distributed? Right? Like, <laughs> right? So, so say this is a shared nothing architecture, right? I can start my transaction there, but then I can update something in P3. Actually, I'll, I'll show examples in the next slide. There's no reason you can't do that. The first question is, are they like distribution that cannot be like distributed? And you say like, yes. The, the question is, are there uh, any transactions that cannot be distributed? So which means do you have to like, like perform it in a single panel? Uh, I think what you're saying, are there transactions where they only have to touch data at a single node?
uh, um, if the data is at a single node, you can ex you don't have to make it. It doesn't have to be distributed. You don't need to coordinate with anybody else, right? Yeah. If if you have such data multiple nodes, then that's considered a distributed transaction. Let me go through these examples, and if you're, if you're still confused, we can, we can answer more questions. Okay. Okay. So the uh, again centralized decentralized ar uh, architectures. So the centralized architecture. Uh, one example of this is called a TP monitor or transaction processing monitor. So these, these are really big in the 70s and 80s. Um, think of this as like you have a separate piece of software that's running on some separate machine and your application always has to go through that and ask it whether it's allowed to do something on, 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 on the database or other machines. So this is really big in the 70s and 80s because people had these, these databases that didn't support, you know, support concurrent scroll transactions locally but there's nothing that could allow you to federate them and have a global transaction across them. So say like you're like, you're like an airline, you have one database for payment information and one database for airline reservations or the seat assignments. So what you want to be able to do is have a single global transaction that updates the seat database and updates the payment database. And then once all those, those guys you know, are completed, then the transaction is actually finally done. So this is what TP monitors were, were, were used for. They're still used today. They're actually very expensive. Um, and, but they're very common in sort of older enterprise legacy applications. But nowadays, most, if you, if you have a distributed database that supports transactions, you don't need a TP monitor because this, this does this for you. All right, so let's look and see how this would work. So we have, again, our application server, but now we have our coordinator. Again, this could be our TP monitor or you know, essentially what it is, right? Uh, and so now, if I want to touch data at these three partitions, so this is a distributed transaction. I'm touching data at partitions one, three, and four. So before I can begin, I, the application server has to go to the coordinator and, says, uh, and say, I need to lock these partitions because I'm going to access data at them. So the coordinator now is going to have that same lock table that you guys implemented for the third project where it's going to know what transactions hold what locks to what data objects. So to keep this simple here, I'm just going to assume that we can lock the entire partition. But all the same lock granularity and, and hierarchy stuff that we talked about before can be used in this environment as well. So we can lock single records or, 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 or ranges or, or pages or whatever. It doesn't matter. For our purposes, we're going to lock partitions. So once the coordinator, if nobody else is running or nobody else locks these partitions, it updates its lock table, sends back an acknowledgment to the application server to say, yes, now you can proceed because you have the locks for these data objects. So now, now the application server can send its query requests to these different nodes and, and, and do whatever it, that it wants to do on them. So then when it wants to commit, though, it's going to go to the coordinator and say, all right, I did all my changes. I need to commit now. Is that going to happen or not? Like, tell me yes or no. So now the coordinator is going to do is going to send some internal messages to the partitions and say, all right, you know, transaction one, two, three that made these updates uh, and that you should know about, it wants to commit. Let me know whether it's, it's safe to do this or not. And then once they all say, yes, you're allowed to do this, then you send back the acknowledgement to the application server from the coordinator and say, yes, your transaction committed. Now, whether the coordinator sends the, you know, pushes the commit message and tells these guys to commit, or whether the application server does that, it, it, it doesn't necessarily matter, right? It's, it's an implementation detail. But the reason why the coordinator has to go to these other guys and say, all right, are you allowed to commit? Is this transaction allowed to commit? Because there may be some integrity constraints or other things that you need to enforce that the coordinator is not going to know about that is only known at these local nodes. Right? In my example here, all I did was lock the partition. All right? I, I didn't tell the coordinator exactly what I was going to do. So I could have updated some record maybe I shouldn't have or, or some, other, some other reason why I could, I could not be allowed to commit. And the coordinator is not going to be able to make that decision. Right? It can do deadlock detection or whatever concurrent protocol it's using up above. It can do that for the state it knows about, but you always have to ask these guys whether they're allowed to commit or not. Does that make sense or no? Yeah, my question is like, is there any like transaction that cannot be like performing distributed manner for some reason? Your question is, is there any, could there ever be a transaction that you could not perform in a distributed manner? Yeah. No. Then uh, think about whether that's true or not. Yeah, there's, there's no, I can't think of any reason why not. There might be harder reasons, but logically there is no reason. Yeah. Uh, right, so, so like, 
think of, I mean, we're running out, low on time, but the, think of the most simplest thing you could do is you, you could build a distributed database that only has serial execution. So you could have a coordinator only allow one transaction across a thousand machines run at a time. That's for OLAP. For OLAP too, it doesn't matter. But for, for, we're focusing on updating the updating state of the database here. Okay. Yes. You actually might have some sort of security related reasons. Like if somebody says that there cannot be any dependency between these two blocks of data because there's a security issue, then that might be the case. That you would not be allowed to commit or not? Or not, or not be allowed to execute and distribute. Right. So his statement is that there may be a security reason uh, that would not prevent a transaction from being executed in a distributed environment. Yes, that's higher level semantics or higher level concept that as database implementers, we don't know about, we don't care about. I'm sure this is going to be on video now. It's going to burn me some later point, but I don't care about security, at least at, least at this point here. OK? OK. So another way to have a centralized coordinator is to have what's called a middleware, where this is basically as a proxy where the application server is always going to have to go through this to, in order to execute the query. So it sort of sees the middleware as the single entry point for the database. It can't access the partitions directly. Right? And so if I send in my query request, it always has to go through the middleware. And the middleware has some kind of internal, again, uh, partitioning table or lock table where it can say, all right, well, this, uh, this query, these queries need to touch these three partitions. So I'll go ahead and lock these three partitions for, for this transaction. And then it sends the messages to the partitions, get back to the data, and then sends the result back to the, to the, uh, to the application. So the application server only sees the middleware machine. It doesn't see the, the other ones. So then when it wants to go ahead and commit, same thing as before, the middleware has to ask these guys whether it's allowed to commit. Because again, it doesn't know exactly what update it did on the machines. Because all it was is just routing the queries to, to, to the appropriate location. So this is probably more common now uh, in, in, in distributed shared nothing systems. Uh, this is, I mean, I don't want to go through full details of things, but this is actually very common in, in a lot of uh, early cloud systems, right? This middleware essentially would be the, the router to say, well, what shard of my SQL do you need to send your query to, right? And in a decentralized system, uh, what happens is that we send the, a begin request to start a transaction to some partition, and this partition essentially gets, gets anointed as the base partition or the coordinating partition or the, the, the home partition. It has different names in, in different systems. But now what will happen is this partition will send back a transaction ID to, to the application server. And now it can send any query request to any machine that it wants, but passes along the transaction ID that it, that it, that it got from the first guy. Um, and they keep track internally about all these updates that you're doing. So then when I want to do a commit, I go back to my base partition and say, I want to commit my transaction. And then internally, this, this guy checks with the other system, the other partitions to figure out whether it's actually safe to commit or not. Yes? How does this square with the transparency idea in terms of the application server needing to know which partition it should be involved? So his question is, how does this, when I said before that we, we, we have data transparency, how is my example here, how does that fit in that paradigm? So, How do I say this? Some systems will push back to you some metadata about where to route queries to, to your, your partition. But also it could be the case here that like, say I only send my query request to partition P1. P1 knows, all right, I don't have the data you want. It's really at P3. So it forwards that request to P3. P3 executes it, sends it back to P1, and then P1 sends back the result. Right? That's, that's how you solve that one. Um, but there are, again, there, this is obviously an extra round trip, extra traffic in the, in the, in the network. For OLTP, it doesn't matter too much because you're not sending, transmitting too much data. Um, but it does, you know, does have uh, congestion on the network. So again, you can provide hints back to this. Next time you execute this query, go to P3, not, not me. Of course, and if you're a store procedure, you just send my query request or my, my, my transaction request to one machine. It executes there, and then knows how to get the data that you need, and you don't have that problem. Um, typically, what you do want to do is the, the the base partition is the is the partition that is going to have most of the data that you're going to access. So let's say in the, in the TPCC example, I'm going to access data mostly at this one warehouse, but I need to get one record from another warehouse. 
So my base partition should be the location where most of my queries need to get, go access data from. And then if I have to go to another machine, it's, it's, not, it's not that big of a deal. OK, so I've been very hand-wavy now about committing transactions, of how we actually figure out whether it's safe to commit or not. And so all of the things we talked about for three weeks with Concurrential apply here. And as I said before, a concurrent protocol either has to be two-phase locking or timestamp ordering. That's still true in a distributed environment. So there's distributed versions of all the algorithms that we talked about before, right? Uh, you just adapt them to say, all right, well, now I need to go you know, to this other machine to figure out what's going on, rather than having all the data you need locally. So timestamp ordering, uh, the, the OCC, all the variants of two-phase locking all still apply here. Uh, the only thing I'll show you in the next slide is when you want to do deadlock detection, that's a bit more tricky because now you have to deal with, you know, how do you have a global view of who's waiting for who. But I would say in a distributed concurrent control, it's much harder than single node concurrent control because you've got to deal with replication, which we'll talk about later. You've got to deal with the, the delay of sending network messages or the net, actually network messages can go, go missing or get unordered. Nodes can go down while you're executing transactions and how do you handle that? And then in the case of any time you need to assign unique timestamps for transactions, now you can't rely on the system clock anymore because the nodes may not be in sync, right? The harbor clocks drift all the time. That's why you run things like NTP to try to keep them in sync. Um, but the most you maybe get is you know, a couple milliseconds of, of accuracy. So now you don't have a global clock anymore to figure out who comes first. So the way Google solves this in Spanner is that they have the harbor atomic clocks and GPS devices on every single node to allow them to assign timestamps. But you still have to, they're not going to be completely in sync. You still have to wait a little bit to see if anybody shows up from another machine uh, when, you're, when you're trying to commit a transaction with a lower timestamp than you. It just allows them to bound what that, that, what that drift is. But it doesn't go away entirely. Yes? So his question is, for here, what is the difference between a middleware and a TP monitor, or a centralized coordinator? So in, with the centralized coordinator, the coordinator is just the thing you ask, am I, uh, am I allowed to do something before I do it? So in this case here, I want to access a partition. I want to lock that partition. The state, the lock table state is stored at the centralized coordinator. So once I have that, then I can send my message directly to the partitions. In the middleware approach, uh, I always have to go through the middleware. It's going to maintain that same lock table as, as, the, as the, the, the TP monitor, but I route all my queries to it, and then it figures out where, where, where to actually send the, the, the requests. Why is preferred over the So the, the question is, why is the middleware preferred over the coordinator? Um, I wouldn't say it was preferred, but this is probably more common now, right? Because by adding a middleware, you have to always first go to the middleware and then go to the partition instead of directly. Correct. It, 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 like, so it's sort of related to the question he asked earlier. It's, it's like, if doesn't, this, doesn't having the, the applications ever go directly to the partitions break that data transparency, the middleware solves that, it, right? So if you do this, you have to either route queries where they need to go or push some logic in the application server that says, here's where you need to go, but they need to make sure that's always you know, in sync. With the middleware, you never have to do that. Right? You just point it at a single proxy, you send all your queries there, and then it's responsible for figuring out where things go. Again, when most people in, 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 in the, the mid-2000s, actually probably even still today, when they want to sh you know, scale out MySQL, they always write their own sharding layer that does essentially this. Right? Yes? Yes. It doesn't have to be. It's, it's, think of it as, as a single, separate, logical piece of software process. Right? You could have everything on the same machine with a bunch of Docker installation. It doesn't matter. OK. So let me show you a quick example of distributed two-phase locking. So we have, we have a, our database is partitioned across two nodes. Uh, object A is stored in on node 1. Object 2 is stored in node 2. Two transactions start exactly at the same time on different, from different application servers. Uh, 
And so in the first case, the first query for the first transaction, T1, wants to update A, so it gets, gets the lock on that. Second transaction wants to update B, it gets the lock for that. And executes that query, gets back the result, and it's done. Now the next query they want to do is the first guy wants to update B, the second guy wants to update A, and of course we know this is a deadlock because they're gonna, it's, it's two-phase locking, they're going to hold the locks for the objects they already acquired locks for, then they try to go get the lock for the other guy, and then they'll find that it's being held by the other transaction, but they're both waiting each, for each other. So the tricky thing here is where do we actually maintain the weights for a graph to figure out who's waiting for who? So in a centralized coordinator, either the TP monitor or the middleware, you know that information because you know what transaction is locked because uh, they have to ask you whether to lock something before they can actually access anything. In a decentralized model, every transaction, every, sorry, every, every partition has its own local view of what locks are being held by transactions that run in it. It doesn't know about the other guys, right? In a shared disk or a shared uh, nothing architecture, right? It can't look in a memory and see the lock table from the other guy. So it has to send messages now to figure out, all right, what locks do you hold? What locks do I hold? And things like that. And then somebody has to build this global weights for, weights for graph and decide how to break it by, by aborting one of these transactions, allow other transactions to proceed. So all the same challenges we had with two-phase locking before are still applicable here, right? How often do we check for, for how often do we check for deadlocks? What do we do with deadlock? But now we're sending messages over the network and it, it makes things more complicated. So any questions about this? Yes? So his question is, in this example, this would be shared nothing. What about shared disk? So again, so it's actually applied to both. Depends on where you store the lock table. Say the lock table is on the shared disk, right? Then in the first case here, transaction T1 gets a lock on A, transaction T2 gets a lock on B. Now you come back and they try to get the locks on the other one. And they recognize that they can't do that. Who decides who, decides who should abort? You could immediately do data prevention and say, all right, I can't get this lock, I can't get this lock, and they both abort. What you really want is abort just one of them. But then now I would say if you're maintaining some lock state in the actual memory of the, uh, of the execution nodes, same thing. How do you send messages to figure out who's, you know, who's waiting for who and who can acquire what locks? His question is, are petitions only for shared nothing? Yeah. So, yeah, so, so I'm. Yeah, I would say for the the no for the for the coordinator stuff versus the decentralized. That also applies to shared disk. <sighs> yeah. 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 Uh, well. No. So, so the the state of the locks would be held. Think of, okay, so the partition, think of them as logical partitions, right? So you need to decide who's trying to access what on the shared disk, and therefore you need to figure out uh, who holds what locks, and still all the deadlock detection needs to be done up above. You're right, the data is still all in a central location. You could use that as the, as the focus point for what, how you synchronize, but in practice people do it in memory up above. Okay. So we're short on time, so let's see how far we get into this. All right. So Everything I've talked about so far has just this, when I say, oh yeah, we're going to figure out what transactions want to commit, all that is just the concurrent control stuff we talked about before. Are there any deadlocks? Did, did I have any read-write conflicts or write-write conflicts? All that still applies in this environment. And then I said, all right, well now the coordinator or whatever it is that's, that's in charge of deciding whether a transaction commits, once, it fit, once everyone agrees that it's okay to commit, we need to tell the system to go ahead and commit. So I've glossed over or been hand wavy about that point. So now we need to talk about how can we actually have uh, the system, when the nodes agree that it's safe to commit a transaction, that everyone says yes, commit a transaction, that we actually commit that transaction. And we need to handle the case where uh, nodes may actually fail during this operation, and we need to figure out what should happen. And we need to handle the case where our messages actually might, might show up late or even not at all. Right, so if a node doesn't get a get, if, if, if you know a node has a long you know garbage collection pause or some other delay on the network, then that's essentially the same thing as the node being down. 
And so how do we handle that? And then how do we handle the case where our node comes back up and now we start getting commit messages from transactions from a couple minutes or seconds ago? How do we handle that? So the thing we're going to use to allow a multi-node or multi-partition transaction to be able to commit atomically across multiple machines is called an atomic commit protocol. So this is where, this is, this is another good example where the, the terminology gets a little fuzzy between how we describe things in database systems versus distributed systems. So in a database system, we would call this an atomic commit protocol. In distributed systems, you would call this a consensus protocol. The basic idea is that we want to have multiple entities or multiple nodes in our, in our, in our cluster come to an agreement about whether some action or some state change should happen. So the thing we're going to talk about here, though, in a distributed database uh, is that we're going to have to ha require that all the nodes are, will have to agree that we want to commit this transaction. In a consensus protocol like Paxos, you can just have a majority agree. But typically, in a distributed database system that does transactions or O2B system, you, uh, you want to have them all agree. And so the protocol we're going to use is called two-phase commit. You can still use all these other protocols. So Stonebreaker came up with something called three-phase three, three commit in the 80s. It adds extra round trips. It's overly complicated. Nobody does it. Um, Paxos and Raft and Zab from Zookeeper are examples of distributed system consensus protocols that you can apply to solve this problem. Uh, but in our environment, we're going to focus on the common case where we assume nodes aren't going to fail, and we're going to use two-phase commit. All right, so here's an example of two-phase commit working, working successfully. So the application server does a bunch of updates to these three nodes, one, two, three, and then it wants to commit our transaction. So it's going to send the commit request to whatever base partition, the home partition that it started off with, where it actually began that transaction. And in two-phase commit terminology, we'll call this as, as the coordinator. And all the other nodes that it modified, we need to make sure that we commit our transaction on, on them as well, I'll call it, are called participants. In Paxos terminology, this would be the proposer, and the other guys would be the exception. But it's the same idea. So in the first phase of two-phase commit, you're going to send the prepare message to the different nodes and say, all right, this is transaction one, two, three. It says it wants to commit. Are you OK with that? Like, are you, are you going to allow this to happen? And at this point, it can do whatever inter internal integrity can shrink checks or whatever security checks it wants to do to see whether that's allowed to happen or not. And then they will vote to say whether this, they're OK with this transaction committing. So they send back an OK message. Then in the second phase, is actually the commit phase, then the coordinator sends a message to the participants to say, all right, everyone has agreed this transaction should commit, so now we'll go ahead and, and commit it. And then the guys, they go ahead and commit. Then you send back the OKs. And at this point, when you get the final OKs from the, the second phase, now at this point here, the transaction is considered fully committed, and we can send back the acknowledgment to the application server. So in this case here, the, the first node could also, you know, it's the coordinator. It could also be a, a, a participant, right? So it could also do its own local check to see whether uh, the transaction allowed to commit. And maybe it does that first and then decides, all right, I can't commit this transaction. So I'm, I don't even bother sending out the prepare messages because I know I'm going to abort right away. Um, but in general, what happens is as soon as you get one abort message from a, a participant, then the transaction is considered to be immediately aborted. Let's see how this works. So now I do a commit. Again, the first phase, send out the prepare messages. So say the node 3 comes back and says, for whatever reason, this transaction can't commit, so I'm going to abort it. So it sends back the abort message. And at this point, the coordinator does not need to wait for any other response from any other node, because under two-phase commit, all the nodes have to agree to commit a transaction, or none of them or, or none of them will, will commit it. So as soon as they get back one abort, it doesn't even wait to get back the uh, rest of the messages from the other guys. It just immediately tells the application it's aborted, and then sends out the second phase abort message to everyone here. Right? And then they send back OK. And then now, at this point here, the transaction is, 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 is done. So one thing I'm not showing here that you would have to do if you impl implement this in a real system is that you'll end up logging exactly what all the commit messages are under two-phase commit as you go along at each node. And you use that as a record to figure out, if I crash, come back, and I was in the middle of a two-phase commit operation, what, you know, what, what, what should happen? Or what, what's, where should I pick up where I left off? Uh, and in practice, usually, though, if, if one of the nodes goes down, uh, 
you just, the transaction fails immediately. Right? So two-phase commit, again, has been around for a long time. There's a lot of obvious optimizations you can do to speed things up. The first is do early prepare. And this is where if you know you're sending a query request to a partition that that's going to be the last time you ever touch data at that partition or node, then you also piggyback a message and say, oh, by the way, I'm never coming back to you, so tell me what happened if I, if I sent you a prepare message now. And so it can send back whether it's, it's OK or, or an abort along with the query result that it sends back. And the idea here is that once you, once, you fin once you start the prepare phase, you can start letting other transactions maybe acquire the locks that you're holding and allow them to start processing ahead of time rather than waiting for the second round trip of two-phase commit. Another optimization is do early acknowledgment. Um, this, is, this one is probably super, super common. This is what pretty much everyone does. And basically what happens is as soon as you get back the, all the OK messages for the, the first phase for the prepare request, you can immediately tell, back, tell the, the application your transaction committed. Even though technically it's not fully durable yet, because uh, the commit messages have not been logged, but in practice this is a small window and most people make the sacrifice. So what I mean basically that, so I, I send my commit request, I send out my, two phase, my first phase prepare message, I get back all the OKs at the coordinator, so now I know everyone agrees that this transaction is going to commit. So I'll immediately tell back, tell the application server, your transaction was successfully committed, and then continue on with the rest of the, the commit protocol like that. Okay, and this one is probably the, the most common one. All right, so as I said, each node has to record all of the, the two-phase commit messages it has to stable storage. Um, in the back, yes? What benefit this question is, what is the benefit for this? Yeah, why, why, why? why do this? Right, so you, at this point here, so you get the commit request, Get, at this point here, everyone says, I'm OK with committing this transaction. There cannot be any other outcome. Crashing. Right, so cr again, but uh, crashing the transaction is still considered committed. The application server may not know about it, but everything's been logged and durable in disk. If I crash, come back, and I recover, I'll replay that transaction. So you basically don't need to wait for the second round trip on the network to get all the OKs that everything is committed before you send back the, the commit request. Technically, from you know, the textbook definition of two-phase commit, that's incorrect, but this is what everyone does. OK, so we've got, now we've got, deal, we've got to deal with failures. So what happens if the coordinator crashes? Uh, the participants have to figure out what to do. And so this is where we start to deviate from Paxos, is that uh, the in Paxos, uh, the, if, the, if the proposer fails, you just do another round of, of, of election to figure out who the new proposer is and, and things like that. So we essentially need to do that here, but because um, the, we could have the case participants decide, all right, well, we actually do want to commit this. The coordinator went down. Maybe I'll elect a new coordinator and still try to proceed, proceed with the, the protocol and actually commit the transaction. Uh, that's all left up to the implementation, and that's a special case of two-phase commit that Paxos handles natively, but in our case, we'd have to be handle, handle that ourselves, and that gets complicated. Um, if one of the participant crashes, then the coordinator just assumes that, the, that it's the same thing as, as aborting the transaction or, or voting to abort the transaction. So the, the entire transaction is then considered aborted. So the main thing to point out, though, with two-phase commit is that the nodes have to block whenever when they're in the middle of a commit process in order to figure out what to do next. So if one guy goes down, uh, you have to then time out and wait to figure out uh, whether you're actually allowed to commit or not. So we're out of time for today. Um, but I'll, I'll just jump ahead and show one slide here. Uh, so two-phase commit is actually considered a degenerate case of Paxos. So there's a great paper from Leslie Lamport and Jim Gray where they show that two-phase commit is essentially equivalent to, to Paxos. Um, that relies on a single coordinator or a proposer and only works if everyone is up. Whereas in uh, Paxos, you can use leases to figure out how to determine whether, uh, whether someone's allowed to propose a new update without always having to do just continually rejecting transactions over and over again. All right, so this is a bit rushed at the end. I can pick up a little bit more of this next class. Um, I'll talk about replication and the cat theorem beginning next to class, and then we'll also focus on then how to do uh, distributed OLAP queries.
So any questions about this or anything? Okay, guys, awesome. I'll uh, see you on Wednesday.